Hello, this is uh, Debbie Stein. I am Associate Director for Policy Outreach for the Institute for Energy Innovation and Professor of the Practice at Carnegie Mellon University. I'd like to welcome you to Innovating for Competitive Advantage, a webinar sponsored by Carnegie Mellon University, Scott Institute for Innovation, and Catalyst Connection. So first I'd like to tell you a bit more about the Scott Institute for Energy Innovation. Uh, you'll see a picture there of the Scott Hall, which is under construction. The Scott Institute for Innovation has been around for about two years. We focus on three different areas, using and delivering the energy we already have more efficiently, expanding the mix of energy sources in a way that is clean, reliable, affordable, and sustainable, and creating innovations in energy technologies, re regulations, and policies. Today we're focusing on the first of these, which is innovations in energy technologies. Uh, Catalyst Connection is our sponsor for this event. Uh, they are a private non-for-profit consulting organization. For over 25 years, they've been helping manufacturers improve their competitiveness via innovation, business growth, lean manufacturing, and workforce development. The energy technology that we're talking about today, which is edible electronics, is one of about 30 technologies that are part of a technology guide we've put together about energy technologies developed at CMU. You can see a copy of this technology guide on our website, either through the URL which is listed on your screen or going to the Scott Institute website, which is cmu.edu slash energy slash public policy for all these activities. Also there you'll see a YouTube video that we have that talks specifically about this technology and other technologies. It's only about a minute and a half. It's an animated video that shows how different energy storage and conversion technologies developed at CMU work including uh, an aqueous hybrid ba uh, battery, uh, the edible electronics that we're talking about today, and also uh, a, uh, a technology that you can use down in the ocean and other locations that are remote. With that, I'd like to introduce our speaker today, Professor Chris Bedinger. He is a professor in material science engineering at uh, Carnegie Mellon University. He's a former Draper Fellow at MIT. Uh, he won uh, an American Chemical Society Prize for Polymer Chemistry and a Young Investigator Award from the Tissue Engineering and Regenerative Medicine Society. He's a co-inventor of several patents and a finalist in MIT's 100K Entrepreneurship Competition. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Professor Bettinger. All right. Debbie, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Right, Debbie, thank you very much for the um, kind introduction. So I want to um, thank you all for so I want to thank you all for attending and sharing your time. And uh, the goal today is to uh, present, to you, a present to you a story. It's mainly, it's mainly contextualized in the field of medical devices, but it can be the technology we'll talk about and the discoveries that we made can be extended to other initiatives in energy and clean water. And so the title of the talk is. Edible Electronics, Materials, and Structures for Ingestible Medical Devices. And so really this was, um, my laboratory is really motivated by the design and fabrication of materials for medical devices. And I actually started my career with the focus on making implantable electronic devices uh, more reliable and more amenable to implantation. So we work on making them flexible, we work on making electronic materials biodegradable, um, and we had some success in the area. But I'll share with you how that sort of uh, created the genesis for the technology I share with you today. So again, we're motivated ultimately by electronic medical implants. And so these are exciting because you can use them as therapy delivery systems to stimulate excitable tissue. You can use them to monitor and measure in vivo biomarkers. And you can also use them to deliver therapies such as small molecules or proteins. For example, uh, the example on the right is an electronically controlled microchip device that can function as what's called a pharmacy on a chip. So essentially, this kind of technology can deliver drugs in any way you want. They can deliver multiple drugs. They can undergo programmed release. This device can also, uh, is important from a um, regulatory perspective because you can decouple uh, the payload that you're delivering from the actual device that's metering the delivery. So that's very important. But 
with all implants and what I've seen uh, and many have seen um, over the decades is that there are a lot of challenges with these kinds of uh, this kind of approach. So first of all, implants become infected. Uh, the localized chronic inflammatory response can alter the reliability or accuracy of in vivo sensors. And with any kind of implantable device, it's intrinsically costly because that device needs to be sterilized and it usually needs to be implanted by a skilled healthcare provider such as a surgeon. And so this is all adding to cost in an era where we're trying to manage the cost of healthcare delivery. And so really, we were motivated by the following question. Can we think about a new kind of class of devices that can obviate many of the challenges that are typically associated with the medical implants? And so essentially what we want is the antithesis of many of the drawbacks that I just uh, described. So if we can reduce the risk of infection, if we can sort of omit sterilization steps, we could integrate devices in a temporary manner. If we could deliver devices that uh, rapidly in a facile manner, then that can be that can all contribute to overcoming a lot of the challenges that are traditionally associated with implantable devices. And so, uh, in essence, this idea can be uh, summarized by the figure on the bottom half of the screen. So we want to take an electronically active device that can perform some interesting therapeutic or diagnostic function and consolidate that down into a form factor that can be uh, ingested. So with this kind of sort of idea, this kind of uh, direction, there are technical barriers that uh, sit in the way of, of realizing this, uh, this vision. And so I summarized two of those questions that we are currently uh, studying in my laboratory here at Carnegie Mellon. So the first question is basically, how would you power an ingestible electronic device? And the second question is, how would you design electrode materials and form factors that are flexible and can permit transit through the gastric tract? And so for the, purpose of today, for, for the purposes of today's discussion, I'll focus just uh, on power supply, and then I'll conclude with some other examples, some other areas which our discoveries can uh, feed into. So the good news is, uh, there's a framework for thinking about some of these challenges uh, already in place. And that's because there are actually two examples of FDA-approved ingestible electronic devices that are currently um, sort, of, uh, sort of in development in the United States. So the first example on the left side of the column that you see there is from a company called Proteus Biomedical. And essentially what this device does is it monitors when a device or when a pill is ingested. And so the basic idea is to sort of monitor that process to address the issue of uh, the, the problem that 50% of patients don't take drugs in the way that they should. And so this technology essentially is a, a sensor that gets wet and sends a signal to your cell phone and your cell phone can then talk to your healthcare provider or your family members and tells you when that pill was ingested. And so I want to highlight how that device is being powered. So that's essentially a copper zinc galvanic cell and that's similar to a basically a potato battery that you might have uh, played with uh, as a child. And so that kind of device is very simple and it's, uh, it's, it's very straightforward in terms of the engineering and it was FDA approved in 2012 as a class two medical device. The device on the right is an adjustable camera and many of you have, may have heard about this uh, as well. So essentially this is a camera that can take pictures and relays that data uh, to, um, to your healthcare provider. So this sophisticated device has a lot of different functions. It has image acquisition, it has data transmission, uh, it has LEDs, and all these are encapsulated in a polycarbonate layer. And so because of the complexity of the device, you essentially need to think about more complex, more robust uh, power supplies to drive those electronics. And so they use, uh, in this device by PillCam, uh, they use essentially silver oxide batteries uh, that are encapsulated. And so this is obviously more of a one-time use device 
and it was also recently uh, FDA approved and also has a CE mark uh, in Europe. And so if you think about powering those kinds of devices, you can think about that on the following, uh, on the following landscape. It's essentially uh, a trade-off between how long that device lasts and the complexity of the operations with the risk. So on the lower left, you see essentially a very transient operation of the device that's embodied by this Proteus event monitoring system, and that lasts for a few minutes or so, and it also has very low risk to the patient. So I think you could ingest thousands of these devices and you'd be um, just fine. So conversely, you have the more complex devices on the upper right, and so these include uh, examples like PillCam and also um, other examples by Philips that deliver drugs as well, and these are uh, a little more sophisticated. And so the challenge here is uh, if those devices, if the batteries leak or if they get obstructed, then that's a, that poses a large risk uh, to the patient. And so what we want to think about is new materials that can operate basically as uh, a device with an extended operational timeline that can last for, let's say, 18 hours, which is the mean gastric transit time uh, for something that's ingested. Uh, so can we make a device that lasts for that long but can mitigate and sort of manage the risk associated with those power supplies? And so the foundation for the material I'll talk about today is based on sodium uh, ion batteries in aqueous electrolytes. And this is in collaboration uh, with Jay Whitaker here at CMU, who you just heard about as well. And so essentially the idea is, is fairly simple. Uh, there's, a, there's an anode material that can store sodium ions and operates in an aqueous environment in which those ions uh, transverse to a uh, magnesium, uh, so manganese oxide cathode, and that produces a current which can drive your medical device of interest. And so you can think about this as uh, essentially a laptop battery or a cell phone battery, but where we've replaced the exotic electrolytes and the potentially cytotoxic ions with more benign materials that are endogenous to the human body. And so, again, there's a laundry list of materials that were uh, properties that were satisfying with both of these uh, with both of these technologies, not only the ingestible batteries, but also the flexible electrodes. And so, again, I want to highlight just um, the requirements for this kind of ingestible battery. So basically, we want to have an anode material that's going to be able to shuttle sodium ions back and forth, and we want the structure to promote this, or to at least be permissive of this behavior. And we also want this material to be ideally biologically derived so we can manage that potential clinical risk. And so what we came up with was this essentially uh, the idea of using uh, um, squid ink or melanin pigments uh, as the anode for this uh, for this kind of uh, battery, ingestible battery. So uh, melanin is a pigment in your eyes and your hair and your skin and it has some very interesting properties that lend itself for this specific application. So first, um, it has a really interesting chemistry, uh, a redox chemistry, which I won't go into the details of, but basically it has a redox chemistry that's compatible with that of batteries. And it can also bind cations such as sodium uh, to this, uh, this chemistry and similar chemistries. Second, it has a microstructure that's actually very similar to that of high-performance lithium-ion batteries you might see in your cell phone or your laptop. So it, so it has this really beautiful microstructure that permits uh, loading and unloading of sodium ions, which is essential for this, uh, for this charging discharging process. And lastly, it's biologically derived because we all are walking around with melanin in our bodies, and if you've ever consumed squid ink pasta, that's actually more melanin in a serving of squid ink pasta than you'll see uh, that are in our batteries. And so just wanted to summarize a, a, little, a little data for you here today. Um, so again, this is in collaboration with, with Jay Whitaker. Um, what we discovered is that these melanin anode materials, which are derived from the cuttlefish, so they come right out of the ink sac of these cuttlefish, they actually 
exhibit performance that is double to that of the previous uh, gold standard. And so the graph on the left is basically a plot of the potential in that cell as we're draining the current. And so we see essentially a very stable um, profile, potential profile, and uh, longer lasting compared to uh, the material on the right, which is activated carbon. Also, we found that, interestingly enough, that natural melanins extracted from ink sacs of squid have a higher energy storage density compared with other kinds of melanins, including melanins you might synthesize in a, in a flask in the lab. And so just to contextualize some of these results, what this does is this pushes us uh, out in, in this energy landscape a little further, um, so nominally beyond this 18-hour mark, right? And so we're able to essentially power simple, sensor, simple sensors and uh, simple drug delivery mechanisms using this these, uh, this kind of one to ten microwatt regime, but more importantly, we're able to do this uh, on a longer timeline uh, than previously achieved. And so, again, I just want to share another interesting piece of data with you, and that's basically that we can swap the cell around and think about using melanin as a cathode material. So, namely, the material that's going to receive the sodium ions and receive electrons during discharge uh, of the battery. And so, long story short, we're able to identify uh, an even higher charge storage capacity of the material in this different context. So it's a little different, but we can still achieve a high storage capacity. And if we think about that, again, in the previous context, we can kind of uh, you know, sort of um, improve that pro performance uh, even more. And so I just wanted to summarize kind of a little bit of that specific uh, context. And so, uh, so if you agree that there is value in ingestible electronic devices, which we think there is a lot of value here, um, that melanin and pigments can serve as a key energy storage material to drive those electronics and those mechanisms. Also, um, it could be, um, again, so melanin has, has uh, the ability to really do this, and it can be, uh, a platform technology to, tr to drive basically anything, ranging from sensors to drug delivery therapies uh, to other kinds of uh, medical technologies. But not only that, um, there are other applications for this kind of initial discovery. So since this initial discovery, uh, we basically found that these melanins can serve as uh, cathode materials potentially for beyond lithium battery technologies. So we found there's a really nice uh, reversibility uh, with magnesium and aluminum ion batteries. And so if you have batteries with these ions, you can actually increase uh, the charge storage capacity compared to lithium uh, for certain contexts. Also, the reversibility of uh, binding ions with melanins that we discovered can also be leveraged into other applications for um, bioremediation. So we think this is another uh, potential avenue to commercialize and develop, uh, develop this material. Uh, and I think the open questions here are scale. And so I think while scale and economics is uh, maybe less of an important driver for medical devices, uh, in these other kinds of emerging areas, we think scale and economics becomes uh, comes to the forefront in terms of uh, the viability of, of, of these materials as technologies. So, um, so I want to thank the group members uh, who conducted uh, this study, uh, primarily uh, Young Jo Kim, who's a postdoc in my lab, with contributions from Han Jung Ding and uh, Peterat Proud Fulpabu. I uh, also want to thank um, uh, the rest of the members of, of the team as well and funding sources. So thanks again for your time and attention, and I'm happy to address any questions that you may have. Uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, this is Debbie Stein again. I'm your moderator. Uh, I'd like to begin asking you a question about what kinds of manufacturers do you think might be interested in using this uh, technology? So I think in manufacturing, I think what this kind of, uh, I guess, material discovery would lend itself to um, maybe manufacturers that develop ion exchange resins. So it's possible that having a regenerative resin that can for bioremediation could uh, could could improve um, 
you know, could improve this, I guess, the sustainability of some of those, uh, some of those current technologies. And how much does the technology cost? Um, so the technology costs um, essentially, uh, again, for medical applications, that we think that's not going to be a uh, prohibitive um, aspect of this. We think instead um, that that might be more costly for other kinds of uh, uh, kinds of applications, such as bioremediation and other kinds of beyond lithium batteries. Um, but we haven't really done the economics, and that's something that you know, we want to collaborate closely with the Scott Institute to figure out some of those, uh, to answer some of those questions. And can this technology be used in any aqueous environment? Um, yeah, that's right. So we have performed some of the more technical studies in environments like, um, um, I guess, simulated gastric fluid and simulated um, intestinal fluid, and those are pretty complex environments. So we think they could also be, um, a lot of those discoveries could be leveraged um, and sort of expanded to other, other more kind of dirty environments. And what uh, challenges or hurdles remain to using this technology in commercial, non-medical applications? Yeah, uh, I think it's going to be scale. So, so again, the, I think the way to think about this is that we made kind of this initial discovery um, just based on um, on a hunch, more or less, with, with these natural melanins. And so we're thinking about ways um, to basically scale up the synthesis of melanins in, a, in an economically um, sort of sustainable way. And so... If we can do that effectively, and we're using bio-inspired approaches to sort of manufacture those materials, then we think there's something there's something a lot interesting that can emerge from this. So, as a reminder, that you can ask questions by using the chat or question feature uh, that is part of the GoToWebinar activity. We'd love to hear what you think of the technology and what uh, what issues uh, you might have or how you think it might be used. Uh, what do you think is the primary benefit of the technology? So again, I think you have to think about context there first. So uh, I think for medical context, um, the reason why we sort of pivoted from implantable materials to ingestible, uh, to implantable devices to ingestible devices was, uh, again, some of the factors that I, I previously enumerated. Basically, you know, costs, sterilization, um, patient compliance, things like this. So I think if you can overcome a lot of those barriers you know imagine if you could if you could just take any vaccine as a pill instead of instead of a you know injection right that, that could be very interesting so um, so I think that's on the medical side um, so I think those are those are some of the interesting things there um, on some of the other on some of the other pieces um, I think it's going to be um, I think there's a lot more to learn, and so I think some of the interesting advantages could could sort of flush out uh, over time. So I think um, on some of the examples, it's it's going to be about sustainability. So having recyclability, rechargeability, uh, and some of these ions is going to be pretty interesting as well. And is the has the technology been tested? Is it safe? Yeah, so, so that's a great question. So again, in the, if I contextualize that question for medical devices. Uh, if you think about um, again squinting pasta, basically, you know you've already eaten a fair amount of melanin in your lifetime if you've had a serving of squinting pasta. So, um, so so there's that. Also, the idea that we've shown that these melanins can break down over time as well, at least if you implant them. And so, in the likely event that a device gets uh, ingested, that material will essentially disintegrate uh, over time. So, okay, and can you tell me uh, where this technology is in the invention cycle? Is it available for license? Um, is it, if so, is it for any application? Yeah, so we have we have a fair amount of IP uh, based around um, the drug delivery area, and so we're looking for partners and opportunities with other kinds of um, other kinds of, of avenues, specifically the ones I mentioned, kind of towards the end. So we're looking for um, partners in, in multivalent uh, ion lith, uh, batteries, and then we're also looking for partners um, in sort of bioremediation as well. 
Um, other than biotech applications, what other commercial applications could use or build on this technology? Yeah. So, um, so again, I think I think the 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 two that I kind of talked about are are um, are, are the key ones, right? So basically, bioremediation and also uh, multivalent uh, ion storage systems. And so, so I think those are the key ones. There could be other. So um, again, this discovery was made about it. We published it about a year ago, so it's still kind of uh, fresh. And I think there's a uh, there's a lot of interesting opportunities if we can just uh, you know partner with the right um, with, with the right stakeholder. And uh, what does partner mean? Does that mean you're looking for manufacturing partners? Yeah, so it could be it could be manufacturing partners. Again, I think we're still working out some of the chemistry in terms of the scalable synthesis of these materials. Um, but I think it's also I think one of the you know the challenges as an academic is we work in a very sort of uh, sterile, pristine environment here in the lab, and so we're interested in 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 going beyond that and just um, and putting our materials uh, to the test. So um, sort of into into real working environments, and so I think just just starting that discussion could have a lot of valuable um, interactions back and forth. And how did you become interested in working with this technology? Yes, I think it was, that's a great question. So again, I think it's, a, I'm reminded of kind of the, the Steve Jobs kind of description that you can't really connect the dots going forward. And I think it was basically a culmination of, um, of needs, right? And also uh, some frustrations with designing new materials for, for implants. So I was trained as uh, essentially a polymer uh, scientist, polymer engineer, that we wanted to design new materials for implants, and then quickly realized that it's very difficult to uh, get new materials uh, onto devices that become approved by the FDA. And so I think thinking about that, then we thought about, okay, let's make them ingestible, and then let's make them electronically active so they can do interesting things and have more um, functionality compared to other kinds of um, other kinds of ingestible implants. And then after that, then then came the power question. So how do we power these? So I think it's a it's a very it looks very linear now, but at the time it's, it's sort of um, sort of was was quite the uh, uh, relied upon several fluctuations there. So are you looking for sources of melanin from places other than cuttlefish? And and what about the cuttlefish? Do we have to worry about having enough of them? <laughs> that's right. So that's a great question. So. Essentially, again, that's uh, so. I served on this NSF bio manufacturing panel recently, which is which is a lot of fun. And so, these are the kinds of questions that that have emerged, right? So, if you find the right biologically derived product, how do you get a lot of it? And so, that could be a protein, that could be an antibody, but it could also be a pigment in this case, right? And so, um, we're relying upon a lot of resources and the basic sciences to understand those processes and and I guess leverage. Right, a lot of, um, I guess, biosynthetic pathways that already emerged that already exist, and sort of leverage them for this uh, for this scale up. So, so we think it's actually pretty. It's more straightforward in the case of a pigment like like melanin because it's not really a high value product like a like a protein or an antibody. So it's it's kind of this hybrid material. It's kind of half. It's kind of like half protein, half polymer, or sort of half organic polymer. Yeah. Okay. And is a capsule that encapsulates the battery made up of the same material as the usual materials that make medical capsules or does it require some other kind of special material? Yeah, so the encapsulation is a great a great question. So this could, you know, if you think about the timeline for how these devices would operate, this could be um, anything like they could be operate in sort of open solution in the in the GI tract. So they're designed to work actually without encapsulation and that's why we sort of study these with aqueous uh, electrolytes, right? So you can imagine ingesting a device and then taking, um, let's say, a, a drink of something that resembles Gatorade as, to work as the electrolyte for that device, right? So that could be one model. The other model could be, um, I guess, optimizing the, um, I guess, the anode and electro, the anode and cathode to work in the uh, simulated gastric fluid. And then the last point I'll, I'll mention is that you could also encapsulate that, ma that material in a biodegradable, permeable um, sheath, right? And so that could essentially 
produce a delay in the onset of the uh, device operation. So you think of it almost like delaying that um, that the turn on of that battery, and that's actually very similar to how um, you know it's, it's just like a saltwater bat battery that powers life uh, preservers uh, on airplanes, for example. Okay, great, thank you. Um, this is a reminder that we'd like to uh, that we'd like more questions. We would thank you all the questions you have uh, thus far. They've been very interesting, and we hope that you will continue to submit them. Uh, so our next question is, what types of communication technology could this power? Yeah, so that, that's a great question. So, uh, so our so it could be radio frequency. Um, it depends on. Again, I'm not an electrical engineer, but we work with electrical engineers. Um, so I think it depends on things like where you are in the GI track. And I think in terms of RF, that's the obvious one. But the challenge with RF is that that signal gets attenuated so quickly in tissue that it's it's uh, it's very difficult to extract. Um, so for sensing, and also sensing is very challenging in the GI tract where you have a very heterogeneous environment. And so we focus more on delivery for the moment because uh, that skirts around some of these some of these other challenges. But it's possible to have um, have have potentially an RF uh, telemetry capability built in, and that would have to be perhaps supplemented with an external receiver that may also have to be powered. And so it kind of snowballs from there, but um, I think it's possible for sure. And how, what kind of companies do you work with now, and how do you work with them and interact with them both for your research as well as any technological activities? Right. So um, at the moment, our main corporate interaction uh, has, so, th so there's no ongoing projects at the moment, but, but we're in discussions with uh, primarily pharmaceutical companies, and so um, the idea is to try to, um, I guess, protect high-value compounds and deliver them more efficiently. So, for example, uh, if you want to deliver a protein orally, that's very exciting, but if you lose 95% of that protein in the stomach, then it comes economically just unfeasible. And so if you had a low-cost solution to protect that high-value product, then you could think about um, uh, you could think about other kinds of ways to sort of reduce uh, the cost of healthcare deliveries. Mm -hmm. I think some of your funding has come from DoD. Can mm -hmm. you tell me why they're interested in it? Uh, yeah, so so the DoD uh, that's actually a different a different project, mm -hmm. um, but the the DoD is interested in and in, you know it's basically like a combat a combat care project, right? So how do you take care of soldiers that are in austere environments and um, you know, we're in discussions with using this technology as a platform for monitoring capabilities. Um, also, one thing that's interesting about, um, I'm not sure if there's any, um, you know, veterans out there or people who know veterans, is that uh, they are very wary of implantable monitoring devices. They actually, um, a typical soldier or warfighter would actually not really be uh, amenable to let's say, implant to track them, right? And that can be very useful uh, you know, in wartime, but um, after they sort of come home, they're very, um, I guess, sort of, uh, you know, they have a uh, sort of an aversion to that, right? And so if you think about a temporary ingestible device that could accommodate um, monitoring during, you know, but only temporarily, then that could be something that's interesting as well. And uh, what other agencies uh, fund uh, your work? Yeah, so I have a lot of other projects, and so this is uh, this is actually funded by um, Innovation Works uh, here in, in Pittsburgh. Um, so uh, by by Larry Miller, so who's very uh, generous and gave us some funding. Um, it's also funded um, uh, by um, I guess other foundations, uh, and so most of our other work has to do on some of the other materials. Uh, for example, we think about controlled release applications for other kinds of diseases, and we think about um, new kinds of materials for flexible electronics, and those are those are basically supported by uh, a number of um, a number of, uh, of, of 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 entities. And uh, could this uh, device be used to power stimulation devices, such as to stimulate regrowth of the nerves? Yeah, so so that's a great question. I think I think it, it could actually. So if you think about you know a plantable device that can that can perform uh, kind of a transient function, and I think that's that's kind of the key is 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 the 
it's a limited time scale. So this could never power things like a pacemaker. It couldn't really power like a spinal cord stimulator for pain, but it could uh, try to, let's say, um, harvest or sort of uh, capture and augment some of the natural regenerative capabilities. And I think peripheral nerve regeneration is a great uh, is a great example of one of those. Right? Then you can imagine the device once it's done stimulating the nerve can just dissolve away. So, so absolutely. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Bedger. This is very interesting. We learned all about edible electronics and how they might be used. It's my pleasure. Uh, you can continue the conversation by contacting uh, myself. I'm Deborah Stein. That's S T. INE at Sconstitute for Innova Energy Innovation at uh, dstine at andrew.cmu.edu. And if you want to contact uh, Chris Bettinger, you can contact him at uh, cbetting at andrew.cmu.edu. And he'd be happy to answer more questions about his invention, particularly if you'd like to work with him on a project.